this country is at war with Germany. With Germany. We shall go on to the end. I remember the sheets of flame which came up and almost blinded us from our guns. Big day. Black heavy, strings of red beads, orange balls. I'm scared. Released in the wrong territory, dark, can hardly see. Still shooting at us. Littlefield. Watch those trees. Pull up, Doc. Oh, not a bit of the nose is left, only part of the center fuselage. First out, feet through the door. Doc is pinned against something, pulled him out. Sergeant Davis, two bad cuts behind his knee. Slim Smith went out through the side. Rogers and Rappy dumped out the rear. Gliders crashing all around, horrible sounds. Look out, there's one on top of us. No, nope, went over and hit the trees on the other side. Where's that sulfur powder? Can't find any. Give Davis a hypo. Finally bandaged up. Expect to be shot at any minute. Adam Bone and Ben Winks, glider pilots, they're lying down on the road. They're dead. Gunfire getting closer. Let's get out of here. Where are we? What you just heard was US glider pilot Zane Graves reflecting on his experience of landing at Normandy in 1944. And that was read by today's guest, Scott McGraw. The US glider pilots in World War II were all volunteers playing a pivotal role in delivering thousands of troops, including logistical support. These pilots landed their gliders ahead of ground troops in Italy, France, the Netherlands, Belgium and Germany. Yet, 80 years later, their story is virtually unknown. Scott is the author of Brotherhood of the Flying Coffin, the glider pilots of World War II. Thanks for joining me, Scott. Let's start, as I often seem to do, in the interwar years. <laughs> I, I wonder, had the US ever considered using gliders before the war? Had, had they put any thought into it at all? Well, you know, unlike Britain, to some extent prior to the war, and certainly unlike Germany, who had been training civilian glider pilots for a decade or more, if only because the Versailles Treaty limited them in terms of power aircraft, the US did not do that. By, by any stretch. It, it was really part of the rapid buildup in just the uh, year or two prior to Pearl Harbor. We had a very outdated, decrepit air wing, if you will, uh, in those days in, in the, uh, between the wars. And really when General Hap Arnold uh, took command, it was a mad dash uh, to create air capability in a, in a broader sense. And gliders became part of that. It was his brainchild. You know, gliders were not invented at the time, at the start of the war. I mean, and they were in battle two years later. Just a remarkable story. So it was a, a story of ketchup, uh, starting with the attack on Pearl Harbor, the buildup, and the concept of gliders was born out of that. What what spurs uh, the idea of the use of gliders forward? Were they looking at the America, the American, sorry, were they looking at the Germans and thinking, that might be a thing. We, should we have a look at those and, and see how they go? Well, I don't think it was so much that, but rather, you know, at that point, um, Germany controlled much of the continent. And when the U.S. would finally get into the game, it was going to be with amphibious invasions and against a dug-in enemy. They were going to have to punch through those lines at Normandy and southern France and ultimately across the Rhine and so on. And the, and the concept of vertical envelopment, being able to attack the enemy from the front and the rear, I think really drove a lot of that. Not just gliders, of course, but paratroopers and pathfinders and the entire airborne concept that part of the airborne concept. So when they realized that tens of thousands, perhaps, of paratroopers were going to be dropped at four in the morning, they were going to need supplies and medical teams and communications personnel and ammo and all that sort of thing fairly quickly while they hung on uh, for the men from Utah and Omaha Beach to reach them. And that's where the airborne glider concept really, I think, uh, came into being. It's interesting that because I never heard it really uh, sort of stated that it's sort of a, a more uh, as a in my mind, the gliders are kind of a uh, like an Ebenezer mail. Uh, you know, get get men in, and actually, the, the logistics side of it is is, is never it, logistics is boring. No one ever talks of logistics. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and not just logistics, but I, I failed to mention, of course, they were carrying troops as well, uh, reinforcements and, and and all medical personnel and all that sort of thing. So rather than attack a castle or uh, you know a, a fortification. The U.S. and the Allies were, were trying to punch through well-entrenched enemy uh, from the front and the rear. So the, the, the Americans don't have a glider, and they do develop one remarkably quickly. Um, 
What's their solution? Is it different from what the British and the Germans were doing with their uh, glider technology? I'm not really up to speed as much, Angus, on the German side, but sir, it was similar to the Horsa, the British side. Uh, obviously, the Horsa, for those who don't know, was, was substantially larger and the construction was different. It was wood-based, whereas the American glider was uh, a flying tent in some ways with reinforced fabric. But I think the fundamental role, and they flew side by side, and American pilots flew horses on occasion. So uh, I think the roles were largely similar, again, in terms of supporting the advanced troops in enemy territory uh, during an invasion, uh, each having their own respective advantages and disadvantages. What amuses me is when you look at, when I think, I live near a glider, uh, a glider station where people recreationally take gliders out. And, and, and so I, when I think of gliders, I do not think of those World War II gliders. They're a very different different beast. Uh, they're more like trucks with wings rather than these sleek, uh, huge wingspan things that float around above me. <laughs> sure. Uh, you know, I, we call them gliders, and they were gliders, but the mission of World War II gliders were, was to get on the ground as quickly as possible, ideally in one piece, of course, whereas commercial gliders or, or sailplanes, certainly the object is to enjoy the thermals and stay up as long as you can. It was just the opposite uh, for the CG4A in enemy territory. So how many, how are they training glider pilots? How many, how many do they need to get on stream? Are they difficult to train? I mean, where do you even recruit? Do you take washed up uh, powered pilots or do you just take powered pilots? Well, it was a moving target. Literally uh, in the year following Pearl Harbor, 1942, it, it was really chaotic. Uh, at one point, they thought that war planners thought that glider pilots would require fairly substantial flying experience. As things went along, they realized they weren't getting en enough pilots to volunteer for the glider training as the glider was being invented. They changed the requirements time and time again, uh, at one point lowering them so far that they suddenly had a glut of student pilots, glider pilots, uh, that were sitting around waiting for gliders to show up from the manufacturing plants in America. So. And I think also a key point is if there was a unifying spirit of all those who did volunteer, it was a love of flying, you know, whether it was a, a, a power pilot school washout, you know, or somebody who just didn't uh, pass the physical uh, or a rapscallion who just loves the, the thrill of the adventure. Uh, it was really frantic in, in many ways until they finally settled on the plan. Ultimately, about 10,000 pilots were, well, 10,000 glider pilots were in the pipeline at one point. And about 4,000, as best as I can estimate, actually saw combat in, in Europe. Uh, about 13,000 gliders were manufactured uh, in this country, and about a third of them roughly saw combat. Obviously, many of them were used in training. I would say they're tremendous numbers, 10,000 pilots. And, you know, if you've got – so there's, there's – well, there's more than one – what's that? There's 14,000 units. So that they're uh, they must be getting through those uh, gliders quite a lot in training, <laughs> the, and the rush to get them designed and then find manufacturers, um, none of whom had built a glider before, was was at times a disaster. The manufacturing quality of the gliders in the first year or two was just horrendous. Wings would fall off in mid flight. When I count, an instructor is talking to his crew, his. Uh, students on with a glider on the ground. He leans onto the wing, puts his hand on the wing. It falls off. They're just horrific accidents uh, in training. At one point, threatening even the future of, of gliders. Uh, the manufacturers, some of them were charlatans, literally being built in circus tents in Florida uh, and, and dry cleaning shops uh, in in another state. So while they were inventing the concept of the glider pilot and what his what skills he needed. They were doing the same thing, not just in the design of the glider, but in how to manufacture them uh, to make them truly airworthy. I presume then that when they put the contracts out, uh, a lot of the existing ma air air airplane manufacturers couldn't take those contracts because they're actually producing powered planes. So they have to find inexperienced manufacturers. Ex exactly. Uh, one of the uh, conditions of the glider program from a manufacturing standpoint was it could not siphon off resources, you know, from uh, the fighters and the, the bombers being built again in the in the rush to get them uh, into the war. So, indeed, the foremost manufacturer uh, of gliders uh, in this country was uh, Ford Motor Company. They converted a station wagon plant in Minnesota 
uh, and used their extensive mass manufacturing skills uh, and produced about, I think, 4,000 uh, of the gliders at the cheapest price of any manufacturer in the States because they had a running start, at least in terms of manufacturing. Meanwhile, components, hundreds of subcontractors, one contractor uh, was making caskets uh, before the war. Steinway Pianos uh, was ma were making components for gliders. Heinz Ketchup Company was making components for gliders. So everyone was learning literally on the fly uh, in the race to get these ready uh, in time for Normandy. That's fantastic. It's a testament to a, uh, you know that American Hutt's power of industry to, to, to just, you know, we can do it kind of thing, isn't it? Oh, that's Rose, Rose of the River to there. I'm channeling. Uh, <laughs> now, British pilots, British pilots were combat trained. The Americans chose not to combat train their pilots. Why? Do we know why that was a decision? American glider pilots did receive some basic uh, combat uh, training, but you're right. That was not their mission. Their job was to deliver the cargo, the troops to the battlefield, and basically get back to base four or five hours away, perhaps, as quickly as possible. Uh, they would report to uh, a command post on, on the battlefield. Uh, likely be assigned maybe some guard duty, but fundamentally their job was to get back to the beach uh, on the boat and back to England or to their air base in France. Now, there were a number of examples of uh, extraordinary bravery and exceptions to that where some glider pilots fought for as long as a couple of weeks uh, in Normandy, but but fundamentally th their job was to get back and get ready for the minute, for the next mission. I was just about to say, it just, it's a demonstration how they're not seen as being a one-shot unit kind of thing. Uh, if you Get down, get back, go again. Yeah, exactly. Uh, th that was their job. Again, there were some remarkable stories of, of uh, combat heroism, and there were uh, they were rapscallions. Some of these guys, they, they were known for that. And uh, sometimes it might take them a week or two to get back to base uh, if they found uh, some interesting uh, things to do in a town on the way back to, the, to shore. And the reality is, they were a remarkably dedicated dedicated group. Uh, a few guys gave them something of a, a mixed reputation, but uh, uh, they they met their mission well time after time. So their first major out, well, I think the first outing is Husky, isn't it? And I'm right, since some of those guys, actually, it's a bit of a peculiar commission because they are, they fly with the British. Have I got, or have I got that wrong? No, you're absolutely right. Operation Husky, which is Sicily uh, invasion, uh, was fundamentally a British operation. Well, certainly there were joint Allied troops on the ground. Uh, but when it came to the airborne concept of about 130 some gliders, uh, it was a, a, a British operation. And yet in the, in the run up to that, they realized very quickly, uh, the Brits did not have enough, uh, gliders. They didn't have the trained tow crews. Uh, their pilots had not had many hours in the air. Uh, so, uh, they brought aboard a, a number of glider pilots from America to train in the CG 4As. They brought over the C 47s and the, and the air crews to tow them. So, on the one hand, that made sense. On the other hand, they had completely not enough time to train together in foreign aircraft, alien aircraft, if you will, uh, before the invasion took place in, in July. And that led to some horrific results uh, to the point that Eisenhower, General Eisenhower, wasn't at all convinced following Husky that airborne operations had a future in the war and certainly the glider aspect of it, given the fact of, of what took place. Another complicating factor about Husky was General Montgomery changed the uh, uh, the glider's mission at the last minute. He turned it in. He decided to make it an overnight flight across the Mediterranean. Unfortunately, in a storm, uh, landing before dawn after crossing the Allied fleet uh, in gliders that were being towed by CG forty seven crews with almost no experience. Uh, all that contributed to the disastrous results for the glider pilots in that operation. The Tug crews, were they, so I, 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 I'm not sure I've joined up the dots on this. The Tug crews were, are the Tug crews American? And then the, the, the gliders were kind of British and, a, British and American crews. It was a mix. So you have got a completely Heath Robinson put together force who have not, who are, have never really all trained together at all. On top of the fact it's the first time they've ever been used in battle, really en masse. Yeah. It, absolutely. They had almost no time and, and really didn't even have a full dress rehearsal in, in terms of training and exercises uh, before that operation and took place. It was literally piecemeal uh, right up until uh, the day they took off in a windstorm in Tunisia, primarily. So 
they were inventing the concept as they went. They were test pilots from one mission to the next. And the first one under those circumstances with so little time and last minute changes uh, made it very, very difficult and not nearly as effective as future missions would be. Now, I'm, I'm stupidly made. I made a bit of note to myself that the uh, Glad is going in at Point uh, Grande, is it? Um, 73 were released too far out and 16 made it ashore which is not really a very good strike rate at all. No. What happens to a glider when it splashes down? Did they Well, um, do they float? Generally lost. Uh, 600, more than 600 men were lost uh, in the airborne operation, more than half by drowning. Uh, however, the glider did, did uh, float uh, to a large extent, which, which was fortunate. They weren't sure at the time. That was how they proved it. But nonetheless, when they hit, you know, when you hit water at 60 miles an hour, you're hitting concrete. The impact is just extraordinary. So many of them were killed on impact. Uh, others were able to clamber out and hang on to the wings or the fuselage and, and wait for dawn for rescue ships and, and the sun to uh, give them a chance at survival. Some decided to swim for shore, which generally turned out to be the wrong decision uh, in cross currents in the wind uh, that night and, and so on. So basically, they just hung on for their dear life uh, until the next morning. Uh, anywhere from one to three miles off the coast uh, to bring up on when they were released, how far out uh, and how high they were released uh, under enemy fire or the prospect of enemy fire by what I would call ANSI uh, C-40, C-47 crews, who were also green in combat. Had the Germans expected gliders? You know, Had they prepared any potential landing grounds? Were the use of gliders on Sicily... A surprise, or, or, or were they so insignificant they didn't trouble themselves about it too much? Oh, quite the contrary. Uh, in, in either case, I don't know that they knew about the word glider necessarily, but in terms of the invasion and where it would take place and anticipating airborne support of some say, some sort, they were thoroughly dug in. Our uh, anti-aircraft artillery was uh, very robust, uh, and I think that's what spooked sometimes the air crews to release a bit early too far out at sea, uh, dooming those those glider pilots, those gliders to to crash landing in the ocean. So the very intense enemy fire and their route uh, going ashore literally was between two different peninsulas so that those who got that far were taking enemy fire from three sides, including, unfortunately, some enemy fire from the Allied fleet that they were flying over due to some miscommunication issues. It was absolutely tragic. So... um. Following that, you've got Overlord, but I wonder if they're, when, when they're, they're looking at Overlord, do they look at Sicily and say, right, this is what we've got wrong. This is what we need to change. Do they really start to iron out the use of the gliders based on Sicily uh, for Overlord? From one mission to the next, they obviously analysed and, and reflected on and, 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 and took a look at what battle lessons were learned. From, from one mission to the next. And, and certainly there were changes made in the deployment and, and if you will, the expectations, the realities uh, of what it's like flying over enemy lines that have been dug in and, and waiting for the airborne uh, to come their way. So uh, Sicily was a good test run, if you will, however tragic for what became you know a much larger mission uh, over Normandy. What were they learning? What were they looking to change? I don't think they fully realized on, in several missions the vagaries of weather towing these planes literally hundreds of miles uh, and still expecting the the different serials to be on time, on target, only 10 minutes apart. Uh, th- th- that proved to be unrealistic. Uh, understanding a bit better what the C-40s, the tow, tow crews had to do to adjust uh, when they fly through enemy fire. You know, if they're going to, if they're going to stack up and go higher than expected, that's going to slow them down and mess up the timing and so on. So a lot of it, I think it was logistical, and, and timing planning, uh, just based on what it was like flying that far through the weather and through enemy fire uh, to get to your landing zone or your, or your drop zone, for that matter, for the paratroopers, on target, most important, and equally importantly, on time. All right, so for the gliders, the bulk of them, they come in at, at, uh, in daylight or you know, dawn and dusk, rather, nighttime on Normandy as well, which must have been a bit of a game changer when you can see where you're going. <laughs> yeah, a, a little bit of both. They came in very early. Uh, on D-Day uh, in a couple waves. And then there were two other waves much later, basically at sunset. And then the following day, about mid-morning, a little bit later in the morning. But fundamentally, one of the key lessons, I think, from Husky uh, was that 
nighttime missions were just extraordinarily dangerous, too risky. The cost in, in resources and lives was too great. And, and they basically stayed away from overnight runs after Sicily. So, I mean, Trick, when you see those pictures on, uh, you just post data, a field scattered full of, uh, of gliders. And you look at, is it Oper- Operation Detroit? Has 50 gliders all coming in. How, how do they operate the landing areas? How is it organized? Is there, is there sort of an organization? Is, is there a guy going, no, this way, that way? Or, or do they literally have maps going, you're landing there? Or, or do they just do whatever they can? A little bit of both. Uh, all of the above. A, a landing zone, a lot of people don't realize it, isn't necessarily a single farmer's field. It's a, it's a chunk of land with many fields and, and pastures and so on for a given unit uh, uh, to land in. In the chaos and confusion of battle, especially after flying for four hours and being 30 minutes late or whatever, or, and what's going on down on the ground, the reality is that once a, a glider pilot was released or shortly there before, he's looking down, seeing what's going on, see where the enemy is as best he can tell, where the enemy fire might be less, who's already landed in a given field. And, and largely is picking out who's on approach to a given uh, farmer's field and basically making a decision on the way down that, okay, that one over there, I'm lined up. I can line on the right side of that farmer's field and miss the 10 gliders that are already on the field on the left-hand side. Uh, and I think I can get down there. What they also did, some of them did was they, if they had the luxury, they looked for fields with cattle because if nothing else, if there were cows out grazing in the field, the odds were pretty good. The Germans had not mined that pasture, which I thought was just brilliant, <laughs> just brilliant. Obviously, there are other factors in picking a field to land in, but it was uh, pretty much literally on the fly from anywhere from 500 to 2,000 feet up. I see. It always feels, at the speed these things come down, it almost feels like uh, controlled crashing. They really can't have had, how long do the descents take? They can't have had long to make these decisions on where they were going to put themselves down. So they're making very snap decisions and then trying to pick it up also to land with their own people. So there's some unit cohesion when they get down. Yes, yes. You know, w- with a descent rate of up, up to words of 950 feet a minute, they don't have much time, you know, in a glide ratio of only nine to one. It is a controlled crash. It wasn't that they were all crashing in a literal sense by any stretch, but it's a hard landing. We'll put it that way. Uh, in a very small field ringed with trees, hedgerows, the, the misnomer. So you're absolutely right. They only had a minute or two depending upon how high up they were, what the altitude was when they were released uh, to get down. And they didn't have a whole lot of choice. If, you know, if, if they were a mile off target, they just had to have, find a field and get down. It wasn't a matter of saying, well, there are my buddies down there. I'm going to go over there to that field. It was more about, I've been released. I've got to get down with my cargo or my my infantry safely, as, you know, uh, hopefully, uh, and then figure out where I am. Uh, if, if need be. And, and that was certainly the case. These all, including the paratroopers, did not land on target in a literal sense. Sometimes it might be a day or two or longer before they actually found their units. The glider pilots were, I think, a little bit more loosely assigned in the sense of get down, find the nearest command post, report in, and go from there uh, kind of a thing. So it was uh, literally perhaps two or three minutes of horror, terror, uh, from the time they were released at most to when they had to be on the ground, hopefully safely. What What's it like for those passengers in the glider? I can't imagine having been a glider infantryman in World War II. These guys were inside a, a reinforced flying box, a kite, if you will, uh, a, a few portholes to look out, but few of them did. A great deal of turbulence for hours from the south of England to, we'll say, uh, Normandy. Air sickness was rampant. Some guys would take a, a anti-air sickness pill and maybe two and then doze off and nap because it made them too drowsy. Uh, when it was bad enough, they would throw up in their helmets and pass it back to the guy in the, in the rear and he would empty them out the door if it was you know, that bad. Uh, and then put their helmets on and get ready to jump out once they were finally landed. So they were truly defenseless and they knew that uh, if something happened to their glider pilots up front, they were done. Uh, on more than one occasion, they would take off their flak jacket, jackets and lay them down on the floor under the glider pilot seats for a little more protection from ground fire. Because as one of them said, you know, anything happens to you, sir, we're history. Some of them did that, you know, for two and three and four different missions throughout the war. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back with you in a moment. Welcome back. 
We're discussing US glider pilots in World War II. Dragoon is six weeks after Overlord, the invasion of the south of uh, France. So uh, are some of these pilots, by the time they get to the Dragoon, have they already done Husky, they've done Overlord, and then they're shipping out to Dragoon, or of the 4,000 what what, uh, 4, pilots that are seeing combat, is it that they got fresh ones in for each mission? The entire glider pilot legacy from uh, really Normandy to crossing the Rhine in 1945 took place in only 10 months. Uh, it, it's uh, just a relatively short period of time, but nonetheless, their legacy and contributions were extraordinary. And you're right, uh, between Dragoon, Southern France in August and Market Garden in September, there wasn't much time in between. And there are some, there were some glider pilots who flew as many as four uh, invasions. Their ter- carrier groups and squadrons got tapped. And they, they did this time and time again, each time coming back to their barracks and again, the south of England or whatever, looking at the empty bunks and new guys coming in and getting ready because we're heading for a uh, market garden in two weeks or whatever. When you read the accounts, it's it somehow seems so arbitrary. Does All right, you can be shot. You could do all kinds of other, But if you take that out of the equation, just the, the, the thing itself coming down is a massive risk. And you think doing it that, under fire and everything else, and knowing that the, the the you've got to randomly find a field that you're hoping you can land in, you don't hit the hedge, the jeep behind you doesn't become shackled as you hit the ground or the artillery piece. Or, I mean, to do it time after time after time, it's one thing doing it in training in a controlled environment in you know somewhere in 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 the Midwest of the US where you know what the weather's going to be like. You're right, and and I suppose in some respects, you know. Training to become an infantryman in Kentucky was entirely different than storming ashore in Omaha uh, or or whatever. But um, yeah, I, I've thought about that a lot, Angus, and you make a great point that you know these guys were typically 22, 23, 24 years of age, and and once they flew one mission and knew what awaited them on the battlefield and what awaited their buddies who didn't come home or back to base, how they summoned the courage to do it again. Three weeks later and four weeks later, if they if their squadron uh, was called forward, called for it, I don't know how they did it. And I read so many of their after action reports and their journals and their letters home. They put on a brave face for their families, but it was clear it took a tremendous emotional toll when they'd come back to base and see the empty bunks and, and know for sure their best friends had been killed or or whatever the case may be and, and hear the stories. And yet, strap themselves in if their commanding officers told them to. And the other thing that occurred to me is, all right, uh, Husky and uh, 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 D-Day, you know that you're going to get back relatively fast. But if you get to sort of Market Garden, you're going ahead of everybody and you're you're not combat trained. Your job is to get back, to be backed out. So what are they doing when they're kind of cut off with the rest of the airborne and they're not expected to be infantrymen? but they kind of have to be. Yeah, and that is, Market Garden is a good example with uh, not only just Germany being the enemy, but the weather being the enemy in, in many ways of, of airborne operations. People don't think about it from that perspective, especially crossing the channel and, and so on. So I, I think Market Garden, they did in fact engage in combat uh, much more than anyone would have anticipated. The Allies, uh, the British coming up uh, from the South, weren't able to get up as quickly, a bridge too far and all of that uh, than anticipated. And there was no place for those glider pilots to go in general, you know, until an area was secured and a route to the rear it was open. So uh, in one case, a combat officer rounded up 300 glider pilots and put them on the defensive perimeter. Uh, he was, they were worried about a German counterattack. They uh, you know, were sent out to the, to the perimeter and, and took their positions and in foxholes to relieve the ground troops. And they were there for, I believe, close to two days. That's the realities of war. So, yeah, you're supposed to get back to base, but not until you can. It's a lot of pilots when you put it like that. You know, if you've got three or 400 gliders coming down, that's that's a lot of spare men you suddenly got. Yeah, you know, in, in some cases, I believe it was Market Garden, something like 5% uh, of the men on the ground uh, were glider pilots. Basically, the numbers approached... Uh, the same amount as you would expect in a regiment. And one of the big challenges they had, General Gavin, uh, in particular, James Gavin, was was very critical after Market Garden 
stating in, in very direct terms to senior officers, the superior officers, that uh, the glider pilots, uh, no one was more dedicated to helping the troops on the ground, but was inexcusably poorly trained to do so. Minimal infantry uh, training and that sort of thing, whereas the British glider pilots obviously were, were better trained from that standpoint. So I think if there was anything, the war planners shortchanged the glider pilots was in fact combat training on the ground because they, uh, the idea of them just heading back to base right away proved to be inaccurate, uh, the realities of the battle of, of war. And in some ways, the glider pilots paid a, a horrible price for that. Now, one thing I hadn't realized is because the narrative is that not, there was not, nobody could fly was the gliders are used during the Battle of the Bulge. Because usually the narrative is, oh, the weather's too bad, nobody flies. But I didn't realize that they're, they're, were they, they're flying into Bastogne. Is that the story? December 26th, 27th, about this, literally on top of when Patton's lead elements uh, of the third uh, was reaching Bastogne. That was their only humanitarian mission of the, of the war uh, on the 26th. The weather wasn't bad from a standpoint of a snowstorm, but bitterly cold, deep snow. More from that standpoint, uh, one glider got through. Uh, the first day uh, was a surgical team. Uh, and then I believe it was, as I recall, 60 gliders, a total of 61, flew the second day uh, with supplies, fuel, uh, ammunition, I think some vehicles, that sort of thing. Literally just as Patton was, was reaching Bastogne as well. That's a tremendous amount of gliders that we never hear about. 60 gliders. <laughs> yes, yeah. And, and it, it, brutal losses. The thing that also really struck me was you know, it's, uh, some of these missions, you know, it would take hours for all the paratroopers, you know, airships to, to get over the land drop zones and then the gliders and so on. So by the time the glider pilots were approaching their landing zones, enemy artillery had been honing in their accuracy for hours. They knew exactly by this, this time what was coming next at only five or perhaps 600 feet off the ground. That's rifle fire range. So it's small arms uh, as well. They were these guys were taking it from all sides, literally uh, from a shrapnel and, and our uh, fire standpoint. So in cases like Bastogne in particular, they flew the same route that uh, the gliders had flown the day before. So that second day's mission, it was a shooting gallery. They were flying right through fire that the Germans had laid up a, a curtain of artillery fire. And that happened on more than one occasion. And yet these guys did it. Now The, la the last big outing for the gliders is uh, vast. Uh, vastly the crossing of the Rhine. This is another massive daylight operation. Um, but for the first time, they decide to give some uh, glider pilots combat training. I wondered how how, they, how did they envisage them to be used? You know, are they using them as as uh, combat infantrymen? Because it, 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 obviously we've talked about you know they've kind of been given ha ad hoc roles, but now they're actually given a role. How does how does that work? Yes, uh, it was the first all officer combat unit uh, in the war. It was glider pilots. And it, the war planners had anticipated how the Germans would be retreating from that area, different roads and, and so on. So this unit was assigned a, a key strategic crossroads to guard and prevent the Germans from retreating that night or overnight from that day's uh, assault. And that's what they did. And, and sure enough, a unit of Germans, about 125, if I recall, or thereabouts, uh, did approach them uh, with a tank and, and small artillery, a, a brutal firefight ensued. And glider pilots were able to stop their retreat. Many, many casualties, and, and I believe 50 or 60 pri uh, German prisoners uh, were taken. So their only dedicated combat uh, assignment in the war was extremely successful. Uh, they all received uh, awards for bravery uh, afterwards. Again, you learn, they're lear learning as they go, aren't they? What surprised me about after the crossing of the Rhine was how fast they got back. It was 40 hours summer back in Britain. And I'm, I was sat there thinking, well, it's not like Normandy. You've got a long way to go to get somebody back <laughs> by the time you're at the Rhine. Again, they were test pilots from one mission to the next. And really, varsity, they had finally figured out how to expedite the return of glider pilots once the firing stopped. And, and some of the guys even complained about that. They kind of liked the idea of a couple of days off, you know, before they had to report in. But nonetheless, it was much better or really organized for the first time with amphibs to get them across the rivers and, and all those sorts of things to, to uh, resupply and, and regroup uh, back at their bases uh, for the first time uh, in the war. Very quickly after uh, uh, crossing of the Rhine, we have VE Day. Did they all expect it to be shipped to the uh, Pacific or they, were they hoping yes, to be yes. shipped uh, home with a... Some of them had already received orders uh, to, to redeploy or, or get ready uh, to re 
redeploy. Training had begun in the United States to refine landing techniques because when the war planners considered the fact of uh, Japanese terrain and rice paddies, they were literally uh, looking to see how gliders could land in very small water filled landing zones because that's what they would expect to find in, in Japan. Uh, they would not be able to be retrieved in any way. So how can you land in a rice paddy, get out, destroy the glider, and then report for duty? Obviously, that never took place. Uh, but gliders were going to be part of the invasion of Japan. I mean, you don't hear gliders post-war. How quickly is the unit wound down? Very quickly. There was an American uh, analysis, and in 1952, a, a policy came out that sealed the fate of uh, gliders uh, going forward. Uh, but the reality is, they were obsolete by the end of the war. Late in the war, as you may know, helicopters were beginning to make their presence known. Uh, they offered all kinds of advantages in terms of resources. You don't need a tow plane and all the resources that it would take for a glider. Accurate landing, uh, if you will. So helicopter technology uh, was really opening up a, a lot of eyes because the military discovered that gliders really do consume a, a lot of resources. They're subject to weather. Uh, it's not the best way to land uh, into, into enemy territory by any stretch. So they were discontinued very quickly. They were sold for scrap. A glider is huge, uh, the size of a B-25 bomber. It, it was They would arrive in England in five large crates, uh, wooden crates of grade A lumber. So when they sold the gliders back in their crates, literally you could buy them for $75 in 1945 and, and shortly after the war. And people were buying them not for the gliders, but they were buying them for the lumber in the crates. You could build a family room or a kitchen or a deck or a barn uh, with the shipping crates that these things came in. So they died a very quiet, almost ignored death. Very, very few, if any, were saved for future museums or that sort of thing, unlike some of the other aircraft. Uh, they served their purpose. I think their legacy was extraordinary, that of the glider pilots. But they disappeared about as quickly as they appeared. Uh, in World War Two, it, it always amazes me how stuff just disappeared. You, you produce tens of thousands of something, and then there isn't. I remember as a child saying to my father, "Why did you not come home with lugers and helmets and you know from the war?" And it, 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 I think basically he, he he said, "Well, there was so much of it all about you just didn't bother." It was just, and you know, I'm sure you, when like me as a kid, we were all playing with World War Two bits of uniform. And it all got wrecked and broken, and and now it would be worth a fortune if we'd have yeah, uh, it, not played yeah. with it as kids. <laughs> in my in my case, uh, baseball cards. There are some you know great baseball players. I wish they still had those their baseball cards from 1955. That that kind of thing. But it was a different perspective, obviously a different time. And 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 reading again some of the glider pilots' uh, personal correspondence and so on. You know, I sure can't blame them. They just wanted to leave the whole thing behind. The last thing I think some of them wanted was any more memories and they had reminders in a drawer or out in a garage or something than what they already uh, uh, had in their minds and their hearts and their souls. In fact, I'll never forget one, one glider pilot reflecting on his friends who he lost in the war. He said late, much later on, you know, I keep getting flashbacks of things that happened. I had high school friends, college friends, frat brothers. But I never put them close to the category that I put those glider pilots. Courage that you would never, ever believe. That tells us many stories. And I, I sure can't blame them. They didn't bring home a lot of souvenirs for me, you know, uh, for their families and so on. They, they had plenty of souvenirs in their hearts, uh, in their minds that they perhaps battled with for the rest of their lives. Well, that certainly seems like a good place to finish. Um, thanks, Scott. Loyal listener, if you want to know about US glider pilots in World War II, the book to read is The Brotherhood of the Flying Coffin, The Glider Pilots of World War II. And if this has piqued your interest in glider pilots, in episode 13, I discuss the experience of British glider pilots with Matt Yates. Now, don't forget, if you have enjoyed this episode of the show, why not consider becoming a patron? You can find out more at patreon.com slash ww 2 podcast. For patrons, Patreon will give you a custom RSS feed to put into your podcast software, which you can then use to get extra World War II chat and advert-free episodes magically appearing on your device. So that's patreon.com slash WW2podcast. Well, that is all from me for now. I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening.
Jerry 88 millimeter gun hit our tongue and blew us the hell out of it. The hell out of it. The hell out of it. Stalingrad can never be repaired. Be repaired. As Allied Commander-in-Chief, I have granted a military armistice. 